Okay, so we're back for chapter 11. So Hiccup's being kicked out or is being kicked out of the hooligan tribe along with all his other friends he's just done thursday thursday the biggest event of the year and it's all gone terribly wrong let's see what happens next thor is angry chapter 11 the storm raged through the whole of that night hiccup lay unable to sleep as the wind hurled about like the walls of 50 dragons trying to get in let us in let us in shrieked the wind we're very, very hungry. Out in the blackness and way out to the sea, the storm was so wild and the waves were so gigantic that they disturbed the sleep of a couple of very ancient sea dragons indeed. The first dragon was averagely enormous, about the size of a largish cliff. The second dragon was gobsmackingly vast. He was that monster mentioned earlier in this story. The great beast who had been sleeping up his Roman picnic for the past six centuries or so. The one who had recently been drifting into a lighter sleep. The great storm lifted both dragons gently from the seabed like a couple of sleeping babies and washed them on the swell of one indescribably enormous wave onto the long beach outside Hiccup's village. And there they stayed sleeping peacefully while the wind shrieked horribly around them, like wild Viking ghosts having a loud party in Van Halle. Until the storm blew itself out and the sun came up on a beach full of dragon and very little else. The first dragon was enough to give you nightmares. Well, the second dragon was enough to give your nightmares nightmares. Imagine an animal about 20 times as large as a Tyrannosaurus Rex, more like a mountain than a living creature. A great glistening evil mountain was so encrusted with barnacles he looked like he was wearing a kind of jeweled armour but there were little there were little crustaceans and the coral couldn't get a grip in the joints and crannies on him. You could see his true colour, a glorious dark green. It was the colour of the ocean itself. He was awake now and he coughed up the last thing he'd eaten. The standard of the Eighth Legion with its patriotic pa pathetic ribbons still flying bravely. He was using it as a toothpick and the eagle was proving very useful for teasing out those irritating little pieces of flesh that get stuck between your 20 foot black teeth. The first person to discover dragons was Bad Breath the Gruff who set out very early to check how his nets had fared in the storm. He took one look at the beach, rushed to the chief's house and woke him up. We have a problem, said Bad Breath. What do you mean a problem? snapped Stoke the Vast. Stoke had not slept at all. He'd lain awake worrying. What kind of father did put his precious laws before the life of his son? But then what kind of son would fail the precious laws that his father had looked up to and believed in all his life? By morning, Stoic had made the awesome decision that he was going to reverse the solemn pronouncement he had made on the beach and unbanish Hiccup and the other boys. It is weak of me, weak, said Stoic to himself gloomily. Squidface the Terrible would have banished his son in the twinkling of an eye. Loudmouth the Gouty would have possibly enjoyed it. What is the matter with me? I should be banished myself. And no doubt this is the Mogadon the Meathead is going to suggest. All in all, so it was not in a state to deal with any more problems. There are a couple of humongous dragons on the long beach, said Dog Breath, Bad Breath. Tell them to go away, said Stoic. You tell them, said Bad Breath. Stoic stomped off to the beach. He returns again, looking very thoughtful. Did you tell them? asked Stoic, Bad Breath. Tell it, said Stoic. The larger dragon has even eaten the smaller one. I didn't like to interrupt, but I think I should call Council of War. The hooligans and the meatheads woke that morning to the sound of a terrible sound of a big drums, summoning them to the Council of War, only used in times of dreadful crisis. Hiccup awoke with a start. He had hardly slept at all. Toothless had crept into his bed with Hiccup that night before, was nowhere to be seen, and the bed was stone cold, so he had obviously gone for some time. Hiccup dragged his clothes on hurriedly. They had dried overnight and were so stiff with salt that it was like putting on a shirt with leggings made out of wood. He wasn't sure what he was meant to do, as this was the morning he was supposed to go into exile. He followed everybody else to the Great Hall. The meatheads had spent the night there anyway, because it had not been the weather for camping. On the way, he bumped into Fishlegs. 
He looked as if he had slept as badly as Hiccup. His glasses were on crooked. What's happening? asked Hiccup. Fish legs shrugged his shoulders. Where's Horacow? asked Hiccup. Fish legs shrugged his shoulders again. Hiccup looked around at the crowd, pushing his way towards the great hall, and noticed that there was not a domestic dragon to be seen. Normally, they were never far from their masters, and heels and shoulders yapping and snarling and sneering at each other. There was something faintly sinister about their disappearance. Nobody else had noticed there was a tremendous babble of excitement and such a crush of enormous viking that not everybody could get into the great hall and there was a big jumble of barbarians shouting and shoving outside. Stoic called for silence. I have called you here, boomed Stoic, because we have a problem on our hands. A rather large dragon is sitting on the long beach. The crowd was deeply unimpressed. They were hoping for a more important crisis. Mogadon voiced the general disapproval. The big drums are only used in times of ghastly, deadly peril, said Mogadon in amazement. You have summoned us here at a horribly early hour. Mogadon had not slept well on the stone floor of the Great Hall with the only his helmet for a pillow. Just because of a dragon? I do hope you're not losing your grip, Stoic. He sneered, hoping that he was. This is no ordinary dragon, said Stoic. This dragon is huge, enormous, gobsmackingly vast. I've never seen anything like it. This is more of a mountain than a dragon. Not having seen the dragon mountain, the Vikings remained unimpressed. They were used to the bossing around dragons about. The dragon, said Stoic, must come, of course, be moved. But it is a very big dragon. What should we do, Old Wrinkly? You're the thinker in the tribe. You flatter me, Stoic, said Old Wrinkly, who seemed rather amused by the whole thing. It's a sea dragon as gigantic as Maximus, and a particularly big one. I'd say very cruel, very intelligent, ravenous appetite. But my field is early Icelandic poetry, not large reptiles. Professor Jobbish is the Viking expert on the subject of dragons. Perhaps you should consult his book on the subject. Oh, of course, said Stoic. How to train your dragon, wasn't it? I do believe that Gobba burgled that very book from the Meathead Public Library. He gave a naughty look at the Mogadon of the Meathead. This is an outrage, boomed Mogadon. That book is Meathead property. I demand its instant return or I shall declare war on the spot. I'll put a sock in it, Mogadon said Stoic with a soppy librarian. With soppy librarians like yours, what can you expect? The hairy, scary librarian blushed a delicate pink and shook his size 18 shoes. Baggy bum, hand me the book on the fireplace, yelled Stoic. Baggy bum, baggy bum stretched out one of his great octopus arms and picked the book off the shelf. He lobbed it across the heads of the crowds and Stoic caught it to the much cheering. Morale was high. Stoic bowed to the hordes and handed the book to Gobba. Gobba! 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 yelled the crowd. It was Gobba's moment of triumph. A crisis demands a hero, and he knew he was the man for the job. His chest swelled with the importance. Oh, it was nothing, really, he bellowed modestly. A bit of basic burglary, you know. Keeps me in practice. Shh! hissed the crowd like sea snakes as Gobba cleared his throat. <clears throat> How to train your dragon, announced Gobba. Solemnly, he paused. Yell at it. There was another pause. And? said Stoic. Yell at it. And? That's it, said Gobba. Yell at it. There's, n there's nothing in there about the sea dragon as gigantic as Maximus in particular, asked Stoic. Gobba looked through the book again. Not as such, said Gobba. Just a bit about yelling at it, really. Hmm, says Stoic. It's brief, isn't it? I've never noticed before, but it is brief. Brief, but to the point, he added hastily. Like us Vikings, thank Thor for our experts. Now, says Stoic in his most chief-like manner, since it is such a large dragon, vast, interrupted Old Wrinkly happily. Gigantic, stupendously enormous, five times as big as the big blue whale, Yes, thank you, Old Wrinkly, said Stoic. Since it is indeed one of the rather large, we're going to need a rather large yell. 
I want everybody on the cliff tops yelling at the same time. What shall we yell? asked Baggy Bum. Something brief and to the point. Go away, said Stoic. The tribes of the Meathead and Hooligan gathered at the top of the cliffs in the long beach and looked down at the impossibly fast serpent stretched out on the sand, smacking its lips as it devoured the last morsels of its late unfortunate companion. It was so big that it seemed unlikely that it could be alive until you saw it move like an earthquake or a trick of the eyes. There are times when size really is important, thought Hiccup to himself, and this is one of them. Dragons are vain, cruel and immoral creatures. As I've said, this is all very well when they're a lot smaller than you. But when a dragon's bad nature is multiplied into something the size of a hillside, how do you deal with it? Gobble the Belch stepped forward to lead the yelling as the most respected yeller among them all. His chest swelled with pride. One, two, three, four hundred Vikings screamed at once. Go away! And added for good measure, the Viking war cry. The Viking war cry was designed to chill the blood of the Viking enemies at the com commencement of battle. It is horrifying, electrifying, a shriek that begins by mimicking the furious yell of a swooping predator, which then turns into the victim's scream of pure terror and ends with a horribly realistic imitation of the death gurgles as he chokes on his own blood. It is a scary noise at the best of times, but shouted altogether by 400 barbarians at eight o'clock in the morning, it was enough to make the mighty Thor himself drop his hammer and blub like a little baby. There was an impressive silence. The mighty dragon turned his head in their direction. There were 400 gasps as a pair of evil yellow eyes as big as tall men narrowed down to slits. The dragon opened its mouth and let out a sound so loud and so terrifying that four or five passing seagulls dropped down dead with fear on the spot. It was a noise that made the Viking war cry seem like a faint cry of a newborn baby in comparison. It was a terrible, alien, otherworldly noise that promised death and no mercy and everything awful. There was another impressive silence. One with delicate movement of his talon. The dragon ripped through Gobba's tunic and trousers from head to toe as if it was peeling fruit. Gobba gave a most unheroic shriek of outraged modesty. The dragon placed the same talon upright in front of Gobba the Belch and flicked him like a spitball. Way, way away, over the Vikings' heads and over the walled fortifications of the village. The dragon put his vast, cracked old paw to his reptilian lips and blew the Vikings a kiss. The kiss streaked through the sky and scored a direct hit on both Stoic and Mogadon's ships, which had survived the storm and were rocking in the safety of the Hooligan Harbour. All 50 of them burst simultaneously into flames. The Vikings ran away from the cliffs as fast as their 800 legs could carry them. Gobba the Belch had the luck to land on the roof of his own house. The deep layers of soggy grass broke his paw as he went through them and ended up sitting stark naked in his own chair in front of the fire, dazed but unharmed. OK, then, says Stoic to 400 Vikings, suddenly looking scared but wildly overexcited. So, the yelling doesn't work. They had reassembled in the centre of the village and as our fleet is out of action and we have no means of escape from this island, Stoic continued, what we need now, he said, trying to sound as if he was on top of the situation, is for somebody to go and ask the monster whether he comes in peace or in war. I shall go, volunteered Gobbo, who rejoined them at the moment, still determined by the hero of the hour. He was trying to sound noble and dignified, but it is very difficult to be truly dignified with grass in your hair and wearing your cousin's Agatha's dress, which was the only thing Gobbo could find to wear in the house. Do you speak Dragonese? Gobber asked, stoic and surprised. Well, no, admitted Gobber. Nobody here speaks Dragonese. It's forbidden by stoic, the vast. Oh, hear his name and tremble. Ugh, ugh. Dragons are inferior creatures who we yell at. Dragons might get above themselves if we talk to them. Dragons are tricksy and must be kept in their place. Hiccup can speak to dragons, said Fishlegs very quietly from the middle of the crowd. Shh, Fishlegs whispered Hiccup desperately, digging his friend in the ribs. Well, 
you can, said Fishleg stoutly. Don't you see? This is your chance to be a hero. And we're all going to die anyway, so you might as well take it. Hiccup can speak to dragons, shouted Fishlegs very loudly indeed. Hiccup, said Gobble the Belt. Hiccup, said Stoic the Bass. Yes, Hiccup, said Old Wrinkly. Small boy, red hair, freckles. You were going to put him into exile this morning. Old Wrinkly looked stern. In order that the blood of the tribes should not be weakened, remember your son, Hiccup? I know who Hiccup is. Thank you, Old Wrinkly, said Stoic, fast and uncomfortably. Does anyone know where Hiccup is? Hiccup, come forward. It looks like you could come in useful after all, Old Wrinkly murmured to himself. He, he's here, yelled Fishlegs, patting Hiccup on the back. Hiccup started to wriggle through the crowd until somebody noticed him and dragged him up and he was passed over everybody's heads and put down in front of Stoic. Hiccup, said Stoic. Is it true that you can talk to dragons? Hiccup nodded. Stoic gave an awkward cough. This is an embarrassing situation. I know that we're about to banish you from the tribe. However, if you do what I ask, I'm sure I can speak for everybody when I say that you can consider yourself unbanished. We stand in awful peril and nobody else in this room can speak Dragonese. Will you go to this monster and ask him whether he comes in peace or war? Hiccup said nothing. Stoic coughed again. You can talk to me, said Stoic. I've unbanished you. So the exile is off then, is it father? Asked Hiccup. If I go and kill myself talking to this beast from hell, I'll be considered heroic enough to join the tribe of the hooligans. Stoic looks more embarrassed than ever. Absolutely, he said. Okay then, said Hiccup. I'll do it. End of chapter 11. Wow, we're really getting into the story now. Okay, so remember to read any of the comments, make some um, discussions going on, guys. I'd love to hear them and come back ready for chapter 12. Bye.